Brown told you, but the items that we have played into the record, we do now have discs. So they're marked. Thank you. Today, but they've been asking for it.
here. Somehow you all transmitted electronically to our office, and then our office emails it to the prosecutor so that we can look at it. We don't think um, it be eventually, but not at first. Um, the PFO wasn't addressed. I mean, I know it doesn't matter. I just didn't know if that was something that should be amended. Um, it shows that he pled to the PFO, but not that there was a sentence affixed. And I, I know that has There's actually no been... What? Okay. I mean, I know you can't enhance, I, I would like for you to enhance it to more than life, but I know that you can. I look at it. Okay. I've actually never had life plus PFO, so that, it may be that you don't list a penalty on the PFO. <coughs> I just thought I should bring that to your attention, that it's not um, addressed in the okay. penalty portion. Thank you. Everybody can have a seat. Did the jury follow the admonition during the break? Yes. Thank you very much. We're uh, still in the Commonwealth's case in chief. Commonwealth's next witness. Commonwealth calls Detective Scott Russ. Russ, if you'll come up, you let me place you under oath. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be true? I do, Your Honor. Thank you. Have a seat. Be comfortable. I encourage you to sit up close to the microphone. It's adjustable for your height. Keep your voice up good and loud so we can all hear your testimony. Yes, sir. Can you tell the jury your name spelled for the record? Yes, it's uh, Scott Russ, R-U-S-S. Where are you employed? Uh, Lady Metro Police Department. How long have you been with the police department? I've been with Lady Police just now 13 years, and I was a police officer in Kansas City, Missouri prior to that. And what uh, roles have you I uh, started out on patrol. I was there for a little over three years. After that, I went to the uh, Crimes Against Children's Unit where I investigated uh, physical abuse and child sex abuse and child pornography cases for two years. Um, after that, I went to the Homicide Unit. I was there for a few days shy of six years. And within the last year, I recently returned back to the Patrol Bureau. 
But I have 21 and a half years in the retirement system, so I can retire at any time. Um, I just felt after being in, in homicide in the Crimes Against Children's Unit for eight years, um, I was on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Uh, I just felt it was better for myself and my family and my wife just to return back to patrol and kind of ease out where I started. Were you with the homicide uh, unit on May 11, 2011? Yes. Was it in fact your return to duty? Yes. Uh, I received a call from one of the commanding officers. I was off duty, uh, advised me that they'd found a body at the time they believed could be possibly an adult. Um, and then, of course, they said I would be the lead on this investigation. They felt there was foul play involved. Um, I responded from my house and then went to Liberty High School off Indian Trail. What time did you find out and what time did you uh, I got the call from Sergeant Kroll. It was about 1.45 in the afternoon. And I don't live very far, and I, I believe I was already getting dressed for some reason. Um, and I got to Liberty High School just about less than 20 minutes later. What did you observe? Uh, I got there. There were several police cars. The Jefferson County Sheriff's units were there. Uh, some of their people are school resource officers. Um, there was marked and unmarked Louisville Metro police cars there. Yellow crime scene tape covering the uh, outer perimeter of the area. Um, I met with a couple of the persons now who was there before me, which was Detective Roberts was there. Uh, I believe Lieutenant Wilkerson was already there. Sergeant Crow was already there. Sergeant Latham was there. At some point, the major from the major crimes unit, uh, he, he was there. Um, and really, at this point, we didn't have a lot of information other than a student had uh, alerted his teacher that he had seen a body down below the creek, which is uh, probably a 12-foot drop-off. Um, at some point, I entered as the lead. I was going to just see what we had. I went down then to the area where the body was. Uh, just did a quick walk around observation. Um, at some point, I had asked, originally, we were going to have Detective Maloney do the scene investigations with the crime scene unit. Um, at some point, that was changed, and um, Detective Mike Perry, I finally asked if he would assist the crime scene unit with the scene. And of course, I'll do, as I do the walkthrough of the, of the scene below, the scene above, I'll point out things to them that, that I think is necessary, and I may miss something. So, of course, we all work t together. They may see something different while I'm doing a different task. So uh, we everybody seems to have an idea what to do. So um, I pointed out a few things, which exactly I remember pointing out. I don't know for sure. Uh, at some point, Detective Maroney and I decided to, I guess let me back up a little bit. After getting there, I, we quickly realized uh, or I did because I was made aware on the phone that it could be an adult. After getting there, I quickly realized obviously it was a child, looked to be about 16 years old. We had no uh, no identification. Obviously, we're not going to go through the pockets or anything like that until the coroner arrives. Um, we just we just weren't sure uh, who it was. So I had uh, someone contact our Crimes Against Children's Unit who does all missing persons at the time. They did missing adults and missing children as well. Um, now that is under the guise of the homicide unit, they do it has since moved. So, but back then this was the crimes against children's unit. So they checked uh, just for age, height, weight, clothing descriptions, just to see if there was any missing persons report that were similar, which we could not find any. Um, so then at that point, Detective Maroney and I did a walk of the tunnel that you all have seen photographs of, um, and at that point that's where we come across the lawnmower blade made note of that, continued walking, uh, came back out, made Mike Perry and the crime scene unit aware of what we found approximately where it was at so that could be diagrammed, photographed, and collected. Um, it's, at some point, I know Mr. Uh, Terry's wicker. Um, I did not know he was on his way up there. I guess uh, the Sergeant Crow had actually contacted him. Okay, let's, can I interrupt you? Absolutely. As, as you're walking through the scene. Yes. Well, obviously, obvious things are blood, uh, which we're going to take samples of. Um, and there are just things that you do not know if they are involved or not involved, things as cigarette butts, um, any possible weapon, uh, water bottles, anything that we see that we can collect. It's, it, it, there wasn't a lot down there, surprisingly. I figured there, this area that it was, there may be more trash that had filled up just through the creek in general, but actually there was not a lot of things down there. Uh, just, I think it was just prior to he. 
we contacted a canine unit that is a cadaver dog. Vadim um, Dale, who's a second division officer at the time, I'm not sure where he's assigned at now, uh, is trained with his dog and it's a cadaver dog. And I believe right when Detective Maroney and I were going to walk through the tunnel, he had arrived and started doing the outer canvas of the perimeter with his dog to see if there was any maybe evidence of anything, clothes that were left that had any cadaver smell and or a weapon. And that was done, I mean, it was a good, towards the school, obviously, at the top, you would run into the school. So we kind of stopped when you go to the kind of south area. Uh, back towards, I guess, the Vim Drive area, he went 150 feet, I'm just approximating, out, maybe 100 feet out away from where the body was, uh, along the creek line in the wooded area, up on the field, and came up with nothing. Yes. Well, I mean, just to see a pair of sweatpants laying up there, I think a cigarette pack was obviously raised our curiosity. We want to know what that was. We have one shot, so we took what we thought was necessary, and of course the sweatpants, and I believe that cigar pack, and there might have been a talk bus ticket up there as well. All of those were collected. Yeah, it was. A Here we go. Sorry. It's okay. If that assists, um, I, don't, I don't think really any of the creek bed. It, it's really all obscured by trees. I could probably just explain it just as okay. easy. Okay. But when you kind of. When we walked through the tunnel, it literally was just maybe an inch and a half deep. But closer to where he's at and away from him, it, it was sporadic. It would be a few inches deep, several inches deep. And I think there was even a spot where it was probably a drop off of two feet. So we really didn't walk in the water that direction. We just visually looked in the water to see if there was anything obvious. And there was a, I just remember, I don't remember exactly, I remember there were things in there that looked like they had been there for ever. They weren't disturbed. They were surrounded by either weeds or things of that nature. So we didn't collect anything out of the water south of him. Did you walk down or the northwest. The side yes. Okay. And that's also where the K-9 unit did their search as well. What was the weather like that day? It felt like 300 degrees, but it was about, it had to be, it felt like the heat index was close to 100. If I remember, it was sunny. Uh, it may have been a little overcast, but it was extremely hot. At this time, was it... Uh, Well, there was people in the school that were teachers and things like that, but within the perimeter of the crime scene, yes. At some point, were you made aware that this was the family group? Yes. At some point, I don't remember the exact order, I believe Amanda uh, Galker had arrived before Mr. Zwicker, but it, was, it wasn't that big of a time span. Uh, but I believe they were there first. Uh, at some point, uh, Mr. Zwicker arrived. I consulted with, for sure, Lieutenant Wilkerson. I believe one of the sergeants were there. We had no idea who this body was. Uh, we could, knew it was a juvenile. And it's typical of any crime scene, which I've probably been on close to 300 homicide investigations, been a lead on 35, give or take, I'm just estimating. Um, it's not uncommon for a victim to be laying in the open for everyone to see. So. We felt it would speed up the process of identification probably by hours um, if we allowed Mr. Zwicker to look from above by the school down to where the victim was at. That decision was made. Mr. Zwicker and I walked up. Immediately, he knew that was his son and made the identification. And then, if you, I would just proceed. Um, at some point, I decided to go ahead and interview uh, Mr. Zwicker in my car. And the decision was made to have Detective Maroney go ahead and speak to Mr. Galker, Miss um, um, Campbell, Farland, McFarland, and I, did, I don't even know if I knew at the time that uh, Mr. Young had showed up. I don't know if I knew that or not. I, I knew after the fact, of course, that he was interviewed, but uh, at some point, he I know he was interviewed there at the school as well. And were you aware that Detective Maroney was interviewing uh, friends? 
for the fact I believe, but I don't know if I knew they were there and being interviewed at that exact moment because I was talking to Mr. Zwicker in the car and probably doing a couple other things as well. As well. And did you interview uh, Gallagher as well? Yes, after Detective Maroney interviewed him, um, I interviewed him in my car as well. Um, I don't know if I really have a good answer other than actually looking back when I was interviewing Mr. Zwicker. I don't know if I knew that, at that exact moment that he had already been interviewed, honestly. Uh, at some point, I probably was made aware of that, but I think I just made the decision. I wanted to go into another interview for myself since the victim lived in the home at the time that I knew of with Mr. Galker, so I decided that was an interview that I wanted to do as well. And um, do you recall what he was wearing? Yes, I know shirt-wise he was wearing, it was like a University of Louisville sleeveless shirt and it had a number on it. You know, you're talking about he? Mr. Galker. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna show you what I've marked as Commonwealth 122. Do you recognize that photo? Yes. Uh, that is a photo of Mr. Gawker and Amanda, and Mr. Gawker was wearing a red sleeveless shirt with a number on the back. And we move to admit this is 122 and Any objection? No. Introduced. And um, just for the jury's sake, is that a, a photo of... That's a photo of Mr. Gawker with his back to us, standing next to, I believe, a Jefferson County Sheriff, it looks like, and then Amanda to the left of the screen. And where is this in relation to Trey? Trey would be to the to Mr. Gawker's back. Thank you. Had you received information from Mr. Gawker that uh, put this investigation in a certain direction? Uh, pretty much. Immediately into my interview with him, he blamed the uh, black kids over either at Bridgewood or had an affiliation with Bridgewood apartment complex. Did you do uh, anything else at the scene that day? I mean, after everything was collected, photographed, interviews were done, at some point a search warrant was being drafted for 1356 Vim Drive, which is Amanda and Josh's house where the victim lived. Um, that warrant was written, signed, and at some point, uh, it was served over at 1356 Bim Drive. Did you go to? Yes. I believe I actually did the official serving of the warrant, which is just me signing the warrant. Can you describe the, the state of the house? Uh, they had some boxes packed up. It really wasn't in, I mean, it was reasonably taken, taken care of. Um, did you have CSU take photos? Yes, CSU, we, we just did a, we would all, several of us, uh, did a brief walkthrough of the garage and the house. Um, then the crime scene, what they normally do is take pictures prior to anything being collected, how the, how we found it. So they take four corners of every room usually. Uh, then after those are taken, we'll go back and point out things of interest to us. And then those would be probably, I think they're photographed again, and they put a marker, and they photographed again, and then they're collected. And they know better than I. We're just, they, they usually know what they're doing. So. We all work pretty well together. If you recall, would you, uh, well, could you get in the front door? Uh, no, we went, into, we went into the back door. If you had been able to get in the front door, which room would you walk into? Through the living room. And, uh, is this a shotgun house or are there rooms on the side? There's rooms on the side. What is uh, beyond the living room? Uh, beyond the living room was the, there's the kitchen straight ahead, and there's a hallway. There's, I believe, one bedroom towards the front of the house. A bathroom, one bedroom towards the back of the house, then stairway that led upstairs with those two additional bedrooms upstairs. Could you tell where the children slept? Uh, I think we were already probably told where Trey had slept and where uh, Mackenzie slept. Okay, what were items in bedrooms that make an appearance to you that their bedrooms were on one floor or the other? Yes. And where were the children? On the second floor. For, uh, did the couch have any on it? Uh, yes, it had like a pink cover, comforter. Uh, did you go into the garage? Yes. And what did you find there? Uh, we just looked around and at that point uh, it was made, the decision was made to collect the sword, 
and a knife. What, at that time, what do you want? At that time, we had literally, the, the body was just removed from the scene, maybe within the, within an hour or two. So we were there, and I, I and I'm sure uh, we all conversate and talk and figure out what we're thinking, but at this point, we're still thinking sharp force injury. Um, you could clearly see what we thought were two significant sharp force injuries to the top of the head. Obviously, I'm not a doctor or nor a medical examiner, but that's what we all had in our mind. Um, the autopsy had not been performed yet. Um, so we were still thinking sharp force injury, sharp force injury. That's why the samurai sword and the heavier, bigger knife that was found in the garage was made. But there was nothing apparent that we found either in the garage or in the house that was had blood on it, covered in blood. Um, and of the 300 murders I've been a part of, or the 35 approximately that I was the lead, I think I've recovered three murder weapons of the 35 cases I personally was the lead on. And one of those was a murder-suicide where the person who committed the murder then killed himself. Of course, the gun was still there. So really, excluding a murder-suicide, of the 35 I've been the lead on, we've recovered the murder weapon twice. And there may be one or two I forgot, but those are the ones that I can immediately think of. I mean, specifically, I don't remember anything that stands out about the backyard. The back porch uh, was bricked off. It probably went out about six to eight feet off the back door, maybe ten feet. Uh, the backyard uh, was, you know, had grass, and it goes back towards the, when it goes back, it was uh, maybe 40 feet long yard that kind of goes into the walkway that would lead down to the path that eventually got to the creek. I think there actually is an old, maybe an old beat up pushed over fence in that backyard. I just can't remember. I know there was one next door. Their backyard may have, I did, it's, for some reason, uh, there was like a, I thought there was an old pushed over fence, but it was like literally pushed over and uh, overran by weeds and brush and everything else. And you walked from the backyard down to the creek, didn't you? Yes. And have you retired? Yes. Yes, I think at some point when we were walking around front, that one kicked on, um, and we had already been told about by interviews that those lights were not on that night. They'd been unscrewed, so we were moving around. It was dark back there, so I think it was myself. I actually just screwed the bulbs in, and they just came on. Um, and then I, at some point, we probably just dis screwed them, unscrewed them, just so we could keep working without having to be bothered by bugs and things. But those were not on. We did screw them in. They came on, and we turned them back off. Well, I think there's two sets of lights on the back of the house. I can't remember how many bulbs are in each. There may have been two sets of bulbs. I'm just not sure. Uh, did you do anything else that at the scene? Uh, that was probably it for that night. Uh, at this point, where do you think the investigation? Well, we, we were, you know, obviously the only really information we had were the trouble in the neighborhood with the victim and some friends and the potentially people that had either some affiliation to or lived in Bridgewood. And I know that these people did not live in Bridgewood, but just for the sake of abbreviating the testimony, I'll refer to them as Bridgewood. Okay. Uh, what was the next thing you did on this investigation? At some point, uh, we had obtained the video from the Circle K. I believe it was the, I believe it was the next day. Another detective picked that up. Um, and then, of course, and my normal shift was four to midnight, but I would get in, I was getting calls the very next morning that there was potentially some students at various schools through Jefferson County that had information. Um, so, anytime I would field those calls, I or someone would go to interview these children. Which the next day, um, I believe it was May twelfth, is when I spoke to uh, a couple of children at a, at schools. And really, all, I've probably interviewed totally in this case. I. Personally, myself, I conducted probably close to 50 interviews with various people, um, and I don't really remember anything of significance to any of the students that I spoke to at any of the schools that really had anything. It was more just rumors they heard he would have been shot, just all kinds of bizarre things. So. At some point, did you go to the autopsy? Yes. Did you recall what day? Uh, that was the very next morning, the 12th. We, we would always send a homicide detective any homicide autopsy, um, and of course, uh, just to, uh, that's changed 
just for the time I was there, six years I was there. At some point, we went to every autopsy on everything, homicide, suicide, suspicious deaths, trains versus pedestrian where death was had occurred, things of that nature. Um, that changed, but we always went to homicide autopsy. So I went for this one. It was my case. I was interested especially, and I didn't go to every one of my own murder cases. Um, it's just not feasible at some point, but this one I decided to go to. I was just really interested in the injuries. Yes, they show up there. Uh, the medical examiner takes their photographs. Our crime scene unit takes their photographs and then collects uh, items that, at the autopsy. This was a shirt uh, that uh, Trey was wearing at the autopsy that was removed. And then, of course, with a previous ag ag agreement, I opened these just prior to coming out. So they were sealed properly when I uh, got them out of the evidence cabinet in the back. Well, this entered, is this at 123? Any objection? Introduced. I'm not going to stick here. I'm going to move the sticker if that's okay. This again is the shirt. Shoes of the victim that were taken at uh, the autopsy. Um, Any objection? No. Introduced.
this was a just a yellow paint chip removed from the victim and autopsy. Uh, I can take it out, but it's so I don't know if anybody can see it. Oh, okay. Any objection? No, Your Honor. Introduced. Mr. Gowker, for sure. I don't remember Miss uh, Miss Amanda for certain. Um, the the day that I interviewed Mr. Gowker at the scene in my car, uh, he was wearing obviously the shirt you see there, the 34 with the red on it, and he was when I watched the Circle K video, uh, he was wearing the exact same shirt, or appeared to be the exact same shirt. I mean, over the next several days, it was a lot of the same things. Um, at some point, there were six, I guess we'll call Bridgewood, kids that were brought to the homicide office or spoke, spoken to at some point. Um, there were additional interviews of people at schools that had information they wanted to pass along. Um, I talked to those kids. Um, I talked to... Uh, some of the children at Bridgewood, I've, I've spoke to several of their parents or foster parents or guardians. Um, there's a specific... Did you uh, receive information about where those kids may have been that night? Some of the Bridgewood kids that we've spoken to had apparently... Uh, Come up, yes. Yes. Uh, yes, from a gas station at Barstown Road in Grinstead, um, from a, I think it's Super America Speedway. I mean, I could see his heart pounding in his neck. Um, he was not extremely cooperative. We did take a DNA sample that day, I believe, but uh, we'd ask him to come back to the homicide office, and he refused to do that and said something to the effect of he can't do that right now. Um, on that same day, did you interview Gowker? Uh, yes, that would, Detective Stavi has spoken to Cassie, and then we, Mr. Gowker had approached us because we'd been at his door at first. Uh, and he was taken back to the homicide office where a recorded interview was conducted, yes. Did he try to show you something during that? Yeah, during the interview. Uh, and I, it, Wait,
Uh, I think you asked something about a video. He, he was, um, a, seemed a couple of times persistent to want to show myself and Detective Stavi a video that he had made a sexual video with him and Amanda that night. Now, at the time, it didn't seem relevant. Um, looking back, I wish I would have watched it just for that simple fact since some of that's come up. But um, at the time, I just didn't think it was relevant or necessary to watch a X-rated video while we were in an interview room. Yes, like I said earlier, I probably did 50 interviews myself, give or take a couple. Um, did you um, investigate cell phone records at the Brigley? Yeah, I got cell phone records on uh, a couple of different ones. Uh, more specifically, I guess, I guess we're doing initials. Um, I believe it was AD. Um, he was, I guess his name had come up, or I don't know how detailed you want me to get. Um, I guess his name had come up through some third party witness who said they thought they had heard him say something about doing it. So, of course, when we spoke to him, his, his words were he had talked to us. Without saying anybody's words, did you, did you review his cell phone records? Yes. Records? Yes. What did, what did his name records show? Uh, it just basically shows, and I'm not a cell phone expert, or but the, the ping usually shows the closest tower that his phone is hitting off the time that it's being used. It was not. Um, did you interview Amanda on May 19th? Yes, I did that at, at her home. Detective Stalvey was present for that. Um, on June 10th, did you interview Josh? Um, I did so many interviews. Let me, if you don't mind, just take a look. Get the, make sure I have the date right. Yes, I did an interview with him on June 10th, and that was in my car, and that was at 1360. Vim Drive at Cassie's driveway. Um, why did you, how did he come to be in your phone? As far as I'd spoken to his father and just asked if we could do a follow-up interview with him, his father said it was okay, his father wasn't there on Vim Drive, he was at another location, uh, told me where he was and I just drove over there and he appeared to be expecting me because I told him I'd just spoken to his father on the phone and he said yeah, so I, I just assumed he was expecting me. Judge, at this time we're going to play some clips from the interview and I'll get to this. Okay. Which is 2A, I think. Two A? No, 2B. 2B. 2B and H. H. We don't have any the other one. It wasn't, it didn't seem like, I mean, it was less than 20 minutes, I would think, 15, 10, I just don't, I don't know the exact time without going back and looking at the timestamp probably on the digital recording. It should be.
took the shadow. Oh, was, that, was it already dark time then when everybody was leaving or was it kind of still light up? It was kind of... Or if you don't know. It might have been a little bit of light out, but I, it was getting pretty late. Tell me about the turtle, I guess, that you all or somebody found earlier in the night or tell me about that story. Tell me about what's the deal with the turtle. Uh, we were all down there hanging out. Me, Trey, Donovan, and Wade. We were all down there hanging out at the spot. <laughs> we call it the spot. Right. And we seen a snapping turtle, so Wade was like, you know, Donovan was like, hey, Josh called John, which is Cassie's boyfriend. Yeah. He deals with all that. So he came down here and got him and brought it back here. Now, did your dad go down there with you all at all? Yeah. Okay. Did, he, did John come with him, or how did your dad end up down there? John came with him to get the turtle. Okay. How long were y'all down there with, how long was John and your dad there by down there? Just like 30 minutes. Just a couple minutes. And it was still daylight out then. Yeah, yeah. And then y'all, tell me about what y'all do with the turtle, or what happened to it, or where to go, or? Uh, John let it out over there, I think. I wasn't here when he let it out. He was going to keep it with the fish tank. He was scared to eat the other fishes. It's probably would. Yeah. Now, when everybody was leaving, like the Donovan and Wade, all those guys, when they were leaving, did your dad or anybody mention that they were going to go back down later that night? No. They didn't look for more turtles or anything like that? No. Okay. What about, uh, I guess then when everybody leaves, and what you all do as far as? Well, Trey said he was going in to take a shower, so I came down here and started watching movies and ended up falling asleep down here. He said he was going to take a shower and just calm down for the night. So I just came down here and watched movies. Did uh, you know if he had made plans to go back down there that night or with anybody? He didn't he had tell me if he did, which is strange because he usually tells me everything. That's my brother. Yeah. What's your thoughts on... My thoughts on that? It's blank. I have really no idea. I mean, who would do it? He didn't really have any enemies except the bus stop problem, but I wasn't involved in that because I go to a different school. Yeah, yeah. I can get home later. I mean, because obviously everybody says he's scared of the dark. Yeah. Do you, have you ever known him to walk down that way by himself at dark time? Mm -hmm. I mean, by himself? Uh -huh. 10, 11, 12, 1, 2 in the morning? No. What? I mean, that's the big question. Is we're, I'm trying to figure out how, why he would have went down there? Who? Because he didn't call anybody on his phone. There was no phone calls made on his phone after 6 o'clock that night when he was still at the cookout I and mean, everybody was still having fun playing basketball. So he never called anybody to say, hey, meet me down there. So I'm just trying to figure out. That's the big question I'm trying to answer is who he would have been going down there to meet. Was there a girl? Was there... Would he have been, would he went down there by himself to, to smoke a little weed or a cigarette? Or he wouldn't go down there, but I, I don't see I mean, him going anywhere by himself at night. I mean, I went down there one night a few weeks ago, about six or eight days ago, at one o'clock in the morning. And it's, I mean, the, the soccer field thing's kind of lit up, but down there where he was at, it's, I mean, it's pitch black dark. It's scary down there. I was even, I got a gun, and I'm scared down there. You know what I mean? It's kind of weird. Yeah. So that's what I'm trying to figure out why he would have went down there. Tell me about the night after everybody leaving. You said something about the shower. Kind of walk through that. He said he was going in to take a shower. Where were you having? He said that. We, we were still on the back porch in the backyard because okay. the cookout was just in. And you know, he said he was going to take a shower or something going in. That was uh, Mackenzie there then. Oh uh, yeah, because she took a shower too that night. No, were you? Did, no, she. What? Were you in the house when he took the shower? Uh uh, because I came over here. So as he tells you on the back porch, I'm going to take a shower. He said, I'm going to go in here and take a shower and calm down for the night. And so I was going to come down here and just calm down for a little bit, watch some movies, and ended up falling asleep down here. Now, I guess my only concern is there's a little difference in your story today than when you told the detective over there at the gym, which was you told her that you were in the house when Trey was taking a shower. No, I was. I came over here when he was taking a shower. And that when he got out of the shower, you watched him put his clothes back on. No, they, I heard that he walked out the door fully dressed at the toe, which would, had to be after the shower because it was after I came over here and he said he was taking a shower. But I mean, in the interview you told her, because it's on, it's on. Come up.
telling her that you were in the house when Trey was taking a shower. No, I was. I came over here when he was taking And that when he got out of the shower, you watched him put his clothes back on. No, they, I heard that he walked out the door fully dressed at the tub, which would, had to be after the shower because it was after I came over here and he said he was taking a shower. But, I mean, in the interview you told her, because it's on, it's on, she recorded it, uh, you said that, you, that Trey took a shower and you were there he took a shower and you watched him put his clothes back on. That was your own word. That, that was false. So you weren't there when he took a shower or? Correct, that was it. So as far as that morning when you got up, do you remember seeing the book bag in the house or did you go up to see if Trey was home? Like I said, I fell asleep here that night. Right. So I got ready for school from here. Oh, okay. okay. I don't know if you went back home in the morning or not. Uh, sometimes I do. But not, not that really because uh, I take showers and everything down here. Yeah. The, uh, did, your, did, your, did your mom or, or not, I'm sorry, did, did Amanda or your dad say anything about leaving to go to the gas station that night? Like the Tuesday night or the Wednesday morning? Uh, I think they did, but they didn't say anything about it. What makes you think they did? They didn't say anything about it. Uh, I've heard people say oh. they went to the gas station that okay. night. But did they, do you know if... I know they were together the yeah. whole night. How's your and your dad's relationship? How's that? Tight. Yes, I was made aware. I don't know the exact date. At some point, I was told that uh, I believe a family court judge had requested an Amber Alert uh, be issued, and we have no control over that. The Kentucky State Police are in charge of that. Um, at some point, an Amber Alert uh, was activated. interviewed him again on 21st at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, 2.15 in the afternoon, which is a Tuesday, so I, th I think he was brought back that night before, or maybe the night before, but I believe it was the night before that. And when you interviewed him on the 21st, is that before the interview in Alabama with Gaffer that we have heard about earlier? Yes. Um, I am going to play some clips from that interview and I was writing a note. This is the June 21 interview? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, while we're getting that set up, how did you begin this interview? Did you... He was, he was not in custody, police custody. I mean, he was in a cabinet custody. They were his legal guardians at that point. Um, so I explained to him that he, he wasn't under arrest. Or, I don't know the exact words. I can look the exact words up. I explained to him he didn't have to talk to me, and he could get up and walk out right now if he wanted to. Did you play two clips for him? Yes. And what were they? Uh, I let him listen to the audio of his first interview he gave with Detective Maroney, and I let him listen to the audio of the second interview he gave with me. Um, and is <laughs> did we hear the audio the other day? From Detective Maroney's interview, yes, and then we just listened to my portion, yes. So I'm not going to play that part again. Push pause. 